almost I am. Um, I have a technology background from going to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, it's a long word, um, for undergrad. And then I'm tied to UIC because I went to medical school down the street at the University of Illinois Chicago College of Medicine. And now I'm at Rush. I've been at Rush um, since 1998. I am an allergist, immunologist. And I have appointments in preventive medicine, immunomicro medicine, and pediatrics at Rush, and also Stroger Hospital in Cook County. My fellowship, and since then, I had a combined training at Rush and County, and um, I continue to see patients at both Rush and County. Now, why inner city African American adolescents, and why asthma? So, I'm over at Stroger. We have our clinic over there I'm in my white coat, got my stethoscope around my neck. And I'm seeing the same patients over and over and over again. So let's say you're in clinic with me, I'm talking to you about taking your asthma medications, and then I'm called to the emergency room a few weeks later and I see you in the emergency room. And this happens over and over again. 25% of the patients that are in the emergency room for asthma at Stroger today are back within three weeks. So we have 11,000 visits for asthma a year at Stroger. Imagine 11,000 visits a year just for asthma. There's an adult fast track, a pediatric fast track. But you're seeing the same people time and time again. And this is very frustrating as someone caring for these patients as you're talking to them, you're doing everything you can, but it's not working. So the conventional medical model is failing. We're not getting through to the teenagers and particularly the African-American adolescents. African-American children die of asthma four times the rate of white and Hispanic children. So that's a very high rate. If you look at 11 to 17 year old adolescents compared to the 0 to 10 year olds, adolescents are more likely to die of asthma than the younger children. So this is a very high risk group. There isn't very much research on this group. Everyone thinks that adolescents are a thorny group. They don't want to do research in this area. It's not a very safe area to do research. It's got lots of issues. Um, so research needs to be done in this area. Okay, so then um, I've been doing research in this area since 2005. We got a grant from the National Institutes of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, and then since then we've gotten two grants from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. I'm going to tell you how we've gotten to where we are now, some of the problems along the way, and then invite you to see what I'd like to do with you now and what suggestions you have and what interest you might have. So we're going to talk about ADAPT for Asthma Pilot 1, Pilot 2, Focus Groups, re asthma, um, ADAPT for Asthma Refined, and what we would like to do this spring in this class for the people that are part of this group, of this asthma um, project. ADAPT stands for Adolescence Disease Empowerment and Persistency Technology for Asthma. Okay, I have a teenager. I ask her, what did you do today? Nothing. Well, you know what nothing really means? My daughter, she goes to bed with her iPod under her pillow. The first thing she checks in the morning. If I go into her room at 11 o'clock at night, although she's supposed to be in bed at 10, what is she doing? She's on her iTouch, right? They're all texting their friends, they're listening to music. So adolescents spend a lot of time with media. So because the conventional model was failing, we're trying to figure out how am I going to get through to these kids, and so we decided to go through technology. Um, if you look, here's 1999, 2004, 2009 figures. Um, this is from the Kaiser Family Foundation, the Pew Internet, Internet Trust. In 2009, if you add up all of these numbers, TV, music, computers, video, print, movies, not even counting the additional hour to hour and a half on texting and talking on the phone, adolescents spend 10 hours and 45 minutes using media. Now, if you account for multitasking, so you're on the computer and you're playing video games, they're multitasking 29% of the time, so 7.38 minutes a day with media. 
a lot of people work an eight hour day, right? But they manage to spend this amount of time a day with media. If you look at what has increased the most over time, music. Music is growing at the fastest rate. Um, so that was where we honed in on was music. Also, this is for eight to eight, eight to 18 year olds. The biggest jump occurs at the 11 to 14 year old range. Once they hit 11 to 14, this is when it skyrockets. And it's higher for African American and Hispanic children than white children. If you were to look at this number for Hispanic and African American children, it's even higher. Okay, cell phone ownership has gone up from 39% to 66%. iPod or other MP3 player ownership has gone up even higher, from 18% to 76%. So they own these devices and that's driving use. Again, here, if you look at listening to music by platform, the highest percentage is on an iPod as opposed to other mechanisms. So um, I was fortunate enough to go to the Persuasive Technology Conference at Stanford. Um, and persuasive technology is the science of how interventions based on television, mobile phones, computers, and the internet, MP3 players, and video games can be designed to change people's behaviors. And that's what this is founded on. So um, some of my friends from MIT and I worked on two patents to develop this system. So here we have our network control system and databases. We use the internet and we use a cell phone network. We send the participants music, messages, control instructions to their portable MP3 music player, which is also a cell phone. And then we retrieve answers to health questions, log data through the cell network and internet back to our network control system and databases. This is back in 2005. We actually bought Nokia Engage cell phones off of eBay. We refurbished them. And we did not let them do anything except for use as an MP3 player. Because we just wanted the cell phone to send data and retrieve data. Um, the other thing we did on here is we had two patents so that, you know when you, we, you get a movie, you rent a movie, they have an FBI warning, you can't see the movie until you've seen the FBI warning. We had technology so if they were to listen to the music track that they wanted to listen to, they could not go to their music track. Um, if they could not skip our asthma message, which I'm going to explain in a minute, they could not skip our asthma message and go to the next music track. They had to listen to our message to get the music that they wanted. Okay, so this is how the study was set up. Visit one was at minus two weeks, then we had a run-in period, there was a treatment group and a control group. We ran this with pediatric asthma patients at Stroger Hospital of Cook County. So we gave them the cell phone MP3 player. For two weeks, we observed that they could follow study procedures. There was a manual to use the phone. None of the kids had to look at the manual. They know how to use this technology instantly. The treatment group got the cell phone MP3 player, and we would send them free music. And they would get messages about brush your teeth, use condoms, eat your fruits and vegetables. General health messages in between those music tracks. The control, sorry, the treatment group got the uh, cell phone MP3 player and they got celebrity recorded as messages in between their music tracks. So um, I worked with someone that was a producer. Her entire job was to go to rock concerts, CD releases, and get messages from celebrities who either had asthma themselves or a relative with asthma to encourage kids to take their medication. Um, so Carl Ebert of the White Sox has a child with asthma, Ludacris, Debrat, they all donated their time. Now, just to give you an idea, remember how our prior speaker talked about who's delivering the message? I'm going to read the Ludacris message and just think about it again. Here I am at County trying to communicate with these kids. If I read this Ludacris message, you're going to see it doesn't sound the way it sounds with Ludacris. <laughs> So what up? This is ludicrous. How now the kids that have asthma? Even if you're feeling good, it's very important to take your medication so you continue to feel good. You understand me? Real important to do that. Now I'm hoping that this cooperates. Let's have ludicrous say it. Oh, do we have to? We have to say this out. Is this? Um, how is this? 
this out. I'm not sure why it's not. It's plugged in. Schools. Rush um, runs 
uh, a school-based health center or high school. Erie Family Health Center runs um, health clinics at um, Henson and Ryerson. So we went into the schools and talked to kids that have asthma that are on medications. And we looked at barriers to adherence, feedback on our first intervention, and we asked them about new persuasive technology-based platforms to improve adherence. Um, again, here, a total of 37 adolescents um, participated, all African-American, um, age, mean age was 15 years old. So this is some of the feedback we got. When we asked them, who do you want to get messages to take your medication from? Um, some said doctor, some said celebrities, most of them said other peers that also have asthma and are going through it just like them. So here's a quote. I'd rather hear it from somebody that's actually going through it because they understand. So they can connect with peers facing similar challenges. Then we asked them, what kind of device do you want? Do you want a cell phone, like in the first study, although it was not a brand name cell phone? Do you want an MP3 player? And here's some of their quotes. With the cell phone, you're around a girl and your phone rings with an asthma message and she's like, who was that? Oh, that's about my medicine. It's embarrassing. Ain't nobody going to want no name brand cell phone. They want the iPod. It's name brand. People in the hood will talk about you. At the same time, I won't want to walk around with no most expensive iPod in my pocket. I don't be in the safest neighborhoods and people do things. So from this we gather, they want brand name, but something that's not so extravagant that it poses a safety risk to them. And then this issue of cell phones versus MP3 players, they don't want this to be disruptive and embarrassing. They don't want to be getting a phone call, take your asthma medications. That's not cool. Okay, so this is our new conceptual model, our adept intervention to improve problem-solving skills, decrease social stigma associated with asthma, in the African-American population, having asthma, they equate it with, if you have asthma, you can't play sports. If you have asthma, you're weak. Some people that have asthma smoke cigarettes on purpose to show defiance. I can smoke cigarettes, it's not, you know, asthma is not a big deal. Um, whereas in my daughter's school, if you have a peanut allergy, you tell everyone so people don't give you peanuts, you know, you feel safe. They said, I would not tell anyone I'm allergic to peanuts because someone might try and slip me some peanuts. So it's a very different um, sense of uh, safety. And they, you know, if they're playing a basketball game, they might be almost dying on the court, not able to breathe. But they're going to keep playing. They're not going to stop, go talk to their coach, take two puffs of their albuterol, rest, and go back to play. They're just going to keep playing even though they can't breathe. Um, it, it's a very, very different situation. Um, I've talked to kids that are football players, basketball players, and they're just, they don't want to stop. They just want to keep playing. And most of the time, they're lucky enough that they do okay, but sometimes they don't. We want to improve self-efficacy in taking medications, increase adherence to asthma medications, increase knowledge of asthma and asthma medications, and eventually decrease the risk of exacerbation, so decrease emergency room visits and hospitalizations. Okay, so a couple of things we learned in our first study. Um, asking people if they took their medication is not a very reliable technique. They've done studies at National Jewish in Denver, which is the mecca of asthma in the United States. They did studies where they did self-reported adherence. Did you take your medication? And they had an objective monitor on there. Parents and children said they were taking it 90 plus percent of the time. The monitors would reflect 10 percent of the time. So we are now using objective monitors on their controller medication. So we know, are they really taking it? And at baseline, we're only enrolling kids that have less than 40 percent adherence by objective monitoring. Because if your adherence is really good at the start, you don't need to be in this program. So we're only targeting kids who objectively have poor adherence. Okay. Um, music variety. When I first submitted this to the NIH, the reviewers told me music is dangerous for kids hearing and that rap artists are a bad influence on kids. 
they told me some other things too, and I was just like, what planet are they on? But it turns out that this behavioral intervention was reviewed by stem cell researchers, and I'm sure that they are very good at reviewing stem cell research, but somehow this probably doesn't quite fit with stem cell research. This is a very different population. So um, we, we set the iPods now to 70% volume, so you can listen to music 4.6 hours a day at 70% volume without increased risk to your hearing. Um, or that's what our literature um, says that we're citing um, from, from the audiology literature. And we can't use celebrities because of the reviewer comments. And so what we did is we were kind of stuck. We weren't sure what we were going to do. So then, remember the focus groups where the kids say they want to get messages from each other? So now we have the kids record messages for each other. However, this added another variable before the entire intervention was wireless through the cell phone and the internet. Now we have to do coping peer group sessions where they come in once a week and a social worker facilitates group discussion about barriers to taking your medications, how important is this to you, how confident are you that you can do this, is it a priority to you. So kids that look like you are going through the same issues that you're going through and you talk to each other about how to overcome these barriers and that's when they record the messages for each other that we put on their iPods. And we set the iPods to shuffle mode so that they get the study messages in between their favorite music tracks. And we allow them to choose music tracks from iTunes. So they have entire control over their music selection except for the music tracks have to be clean. They can't be, um, have to be radio edited. So we've gone from this Nokia NVH cell phone that the kids called a taco, thought it was kind of big and not very sleek, to the iPod shuffle um, and the coping peer groups for them to record the messages. Okay. So I'm just going to play a couple of messages from the kids. Why would you do the study? 
So I'm going to play one of the doctor messages. The doctor messages are supposed to mirror the content that they record, but it's just a doctor message. So these are not very exciting, but they're not supposed to be exciting. So let me play uh, this one. Hello, this is Dr. Mosne. Take your asthma controller medicine morning and night to get through your day without wheezing, coughing, shortness of breath, or chest tightness. Hello, this is Dr. Mosne. Take your asthma controller medicine every... So as you see, um, the kids get, and the treatment group get messages recorded by peers. The control group gets the same frequency of messages, but recorded by a doctor. And we are keeping track of who skips the messages, who listens to the messages, and who listens to messages from different people. Because in a group, you might have one person that's more influential. Maybe there's an alpha in that coping peer group, and everyone is listening to that person's messages. So we're keeping track of all that. Okay, I'll move forward. Okay. Um, these are our study visit procedures and assessments. I'm not going to belabor these slides, because I realize that we have to be cognizant of time. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of these quickly. Okay, so what are some of our, our preliminary data? We found that um, with the treatment group compared to baseline, we had a 23% improvement in asthma knowledge that was sustained uh, at week six and week eight. We saw that um, asthma control test score, it's how well your asthma is controlled at baseline. It was not well controlled because it was 19 or less. Once we started the treatment, um, it went above 20, you're above 20, you're controlled, so we achieved asthma control and sustained it. And the most powerful thing, at the start of the study, their adherence was less than 40%. Remember how it had to be low to be able to be in the study? Immediately upon starting this intervention, the um, adherence went above 70%, which is clinically significant. If you take your inhaled steroids at least 70% of the time, it is clinically beneficial, it achieved at least 70%, and we kept it that high during the entire intervention. So the kids, um, when we measure it objectively with that doser CT, the kids are taking their medication. And you may be asking, well, what if they just push on their, their inhaled steroid like 70 times in the parking lot before the study visit? Our doser CT registers how many doses you took every 24-hour period. So we know when you took it. And we do have some kids that are still trying to fool us and are like pressing it a gazillion times before they come into their visit. Okay, so um, where we are right now is we are currently running this study. We have about 80 <coughs> participants who are in the um, treatment group or the control group with what I described. Um, the intervention as. Can I use this? I just wanted to yeah. show where we want to incorporate human augmentics at this point and where what I would really appreciate your input so you can just start thinking about it to see if you might be interested in the project. Sure. Okay, so this will reflect. I just write on here. Yeah. Okay. I've never done this before, so it's pretty exciting. Okay. Um, so we want to give them a smartphone. So if you remember in the first study, it was a smartphone, but all they could do was use it as an MP3 player. And then the second study was iPod shuffles. Now we want to give them a loaded smartphone. Texting, talking, internet, games, music, everything. Just this is a risk because they did a study at the University of Wisconsin where they give kids cell phones and they actually had to get the FBI involved because if a kid under the age of 21 is sexting with someone over the age of 21 with a cell phone that was given to them in a study, the FBI came and confiscated the smartphone to be able to track down the adult. However, if we write into the IRB that these are the potential risks to the participant for being in the study, and the child and the parent agree to those risks, then we can do it. But I think we all are aware that giving a kid a cell phone is a risk. 
they already have cell phones and they are at risk um, right now, but when you're in a study, you have to monitor that. You want to make sure participant safety. Okay, so a smartphone with all those features. We would like to have um, their daily medication. Again, this daily controller medication is what keeps you from going into the emergency room of the hospital. It's an anti-inflammatory. So it treats the inflammation that is causing the asthma exacerbations. So we want to have this doser CT on here, and we want to have Bluetooth. So every time they use their medication, the Bluetooth communicates from the doser CT to the smartphone that they use their medication in real time. These studies were not in real time. Now, I also want to have a doser CT on their rescue medication. <clears throat> a lot of times kids will only rely on their short-acting bronchodilator, their rescue medication. They won't use their daily controller medication. The rescue medication, you take it and you feel it right away. You take it and it works within five minutes, but it only lasts for a short period of time. It's not treating that underlying inflammation which you need to treat so you don't get worse. And there are people that die with a canister of short-acting bronchodilator in their hand. Okay, They just keep relying on it and they never go to the emergency room or they don't take their daily controller medication. In fact, if you see increased use of this medication, um, we want to be able to send them a message. You're using your albuterol very frequently. Sounds like your asthma is getting worse. We'd like you to do something about it. Um, and that is where persuasive visualizations that I need your help with would come in. We talked about how if you can present data as a bunch of numbers or as a graph or in a way that they want to see it. Just like they're now getting these peer messages, how can we do persuasive visualizations in a way that they would take their medication? So this will also be Bluetooth connected. We also want to give them a peak flow meter. This is a, a Pico electronic peak flow meter. You know how people that have diabetes check their blood sugar? People that have high blood pressure check their blood pressure? People with asthma can check how much they can blow out. So just like if they're using too much of the rescue medicine, we want to send them a persuasive visualization. If their peak flow reading falls low, we also want to send them a persuasive visualization. Your peak flow is falling below 80% of personal best. Seems like you're going to be having an asthma exacerbation. We would like you to do something about it. And then we also want to keep track of air pollution and pollen counts. Now, we don't, at this point, I don't know of a Bluetooth way to do this. I was just thinking of looking at the National Allergy Bureau numbers every day. And I was thinking we would just look at CDC data on air pollution. But people with asthma are affected by weather changes. Cold air can trigger an asthma attack very quickly. Like you can be fine now, go out into the cold air waiting at the bus stop for your bus to come and they're breathing in that cold air, they can have an asthma attack that sends them to the emergency room. So weather changes and also pollen counts. Um, people have allergic asthma. And uh, you've heard of people getting allergy shots or um, allergy immunotherapy because they have allergic asthma. So that's important for them too. If it's a high pollen count day, it might not be a good day to go for a run outside. So. We're thinking that if we give them all these features that they want on their smartphone and we can communicate between the doser CT for their daily controller medication, for their rescue medication, peak flow values, and these other air pollution and pollen counts, it would be a much more powerful intervention. We still want to do the coping peer groups where they come together as a group because I think you need to have that direct person-to-person -person communication and relationship before you can go to wireless only. In that first study where it was only wireless, we improved knowledge but not adherence. The second study where we added that personal relationship, we improved both. So we were thinking of starting with the social worker groups 
and then going to an online social networking system to sustain those relationships and see if we can, if we can go that way. And I don't know, um, I don't know uh, or have expertise in that area, but I'm hoping that people in health communications would have expertise in how best to do the social networking. I was thinking that maybe the groups would compete against each other. So the group that was doing really well on adherence to their daily medication, not using the rescue medication very much, doing well in their peak flows might get extra music or get other rewards um, because these kids are very competitive. Uh, it's, it's funny in the, in the groups that, you know, they always like to know who's doing the best on taking their medications or, or other things. And uh, this is where I would like to open it up for questions. And again, I realize we have limited time, so if we can't take all the questions right now, hopefully you could um, email me or we could talk. And also, uh, if, if you do the asthma group, I would want you to come over to Rush this, during this course, meet the kids, work with the kids, get feedback from them. So if you develop a persuasive visualization, try it out, see what they think. Because we have these studies, like the study up there, we have it ongoing. We have weekly group sessions right now. So you could actually get immediate feedback from the kids um, on, your, on your work. We have Thank about you. five minutes for questions. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Um, have you given thought to the messages within the music? Not putting messages in the music, but what's contained within the music? Um, and how sometimes that may work against your music, or against your messages, especially if they're singing about smoking, or I'm thinking long term. Um, because right now you have the students in, you know, a social support group. Um, but just thinking culturally long term, or what type of messages are they going to be exposed to long term in their life? Um, eventually, at some point, they'll probably leave the program, but the music component will be there. And so I'm just, I was just thinking, have you ever thought that the music you're listening to may be counteracting asthma messages, especially when it comes to I'm not an expert in this field. I do understand that people's choice of music reflects intrinsic personalities. Like some people that are high risk takers listen to certain kinds of music. Um, people who may be depressed or have other issues may be drawn to other types of music. So what you listen to does reflect certain aspects of your personality. I don't know that I could change the music they listen to. Wait, I know you can't, but I just know if you've monitored it to even see like what are they and what type of messages that may work against asthma health may be contained within the music. That would be something very interesting to kind of do a content analysis, not only of the doctor message or the peer group messages, because we're doing that now, we're, we're doing content analysis of the asthma messages. But we could keep track of their music choices and do some kind of content analysis of the music and see if that had an influence. Um, that would be something very interesting. Thank you. This is not directly related to what you want to do with the smartphone part of it, but has there been any consideration given to Because you were talking about how these kids, you know, part of the reason they don't want to do that is one, it shows a weakness, but two, maybe the device itself is not cool somehow, or, you know, I don't know. Has there been any consideration about that? Um, so the devices, the medications we're using are all FDA approved, and it's very interesting to me. Um, you have to approve the molecule, like does the drug work, but you also have to FDA approve the device. So, for example, Advair, people might have seen commercials for Advair. It comes as a disc and it comes as a pump. I think they spent more time getting FDA approval on that disc. And I've taken the disc apart. I think all the engineers would probably take everything apart. So I took a screwdriver, I popped it open, and it's this little tape with little, like, bubbles of the dry powder that when you activate the disc, it pops the bubble and you inhale the dry powder. They spent more time getting that device designed and approved probably than the actual Advair medication. And Advair is so well known and popular because it's the cool purple disc. 
Um, so we may not be able to change, we can't change that. Um, but if we can somehow, like if, like the Advair or the controller medicine. Perception. But the thing is, the, the controller medicines, no one else has to know you're taking them. Because you could potentially just take them at home and no one would know. The rescue medication, the albuterol, that's what you're supposed to have it on you at all times and you pull that out and use it and people would see that. But if you're taking your daily controller medication at home like you're supposed to, you shouldn't need your rescue medication. However, these kids have very chaotic lives. Like I've been talking to these kids and for a lot of them, the only consistent thing in their life is basketball practice and basketball games because they're at their girlfriend's house certain days of the week. They're at their friend's house other days. They're at their grandma's house. They're, you know, they, they don't even have the same, like if I say to them, we'll just keep it in your backpack, but not even that is consistent. Um, their lives are very difficult to have routines. However, a cell phone could be like the third arm, something you have with you at all times. And we're hoping that that is about as close we can get to a routine or something fixed as possible. Because they all have phones. Everyone's got a phone. And, and I've seen some kids, they run out of minutes on one phone and they pull out another phone. Um, so so phones are, are extremely important. Yes? If, if they're going to have these full functional uh, smartphones, have you considered um, doing things like in the other project where you're working with the calendar? or certain times of day when the reminders pop up, like, oh, now's a good time to take your medicine, uh, in addition to the messages that's what we need to um, we, we wanted, we, at this point, we, we are asking participants, what time of day would you like to receive a reminder? Because if you remember that person that said, I don't want no cell phone calling me and telling me to take my asthma medication when I'm around a girl. So we want to send them messages when they want to receive them. So right now we are collecting data as to when you want to receive messages, but we haven't been sending messages. So yes, we want to send them the messages the time of day that they want to get them in a way that they want to get them. And we would like to, someone else had said in response to her talk, well, how do you know that they're using the phone? You know, and how do you know that they're paying attention to the phone? We want to have things built in so that they have to respond to our queries, because um, if it gets ignored, then then we're not being effective. Any other questions? Yes? Is there a way to make sure the person has been smoking? If a person has been smoking lately? Excellent question. Um, I've been thinking about this, and one thing we could do there's a swab, you can do a saliva swab. So you just do a, a swab, you stick it in this um, test tube and we send it to a lab. You know how um, for diabetes, a hemoglobin A1C measures your average blood sugar over the past three months? This cotinine swab can measure um, cigarette uh, exposure levels. So we are thinking that we could add that in. I'm always between, in the balance between our current study there's no blood draws, there's no needles, there's nothing invasive. Because these kids don't, they don't want a blood draw, they don't want needle sticks, they don't want any of that stuff. So I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I don't make it too complicated where I require procedures that are going to make them say, nah, I want the foam, I don't want to, I don't want to do that, that kind of stuff. But I'm thinking that a saliva swab shouldn't be too bad and we could look at cigarette exposure. Yeah, but what I was thinking is that maybe in the picture you go, uh, and measuring this, the, the smoking exposure is, is something that is maybe missing. Uh, one way to include that is to somehow embed the, the measure into the doser. Uh, I mean, you can actually, at the same time that the person is dosing itself, it could be measuring if he has actually a smoke or uh, be, be exposed to someone else's smoke. And, uh, or in the smartphone, maybe. You can actually measure it uh, by some, some uh, uh, device measuring how much uh, cigarette smoke, uh, smoke is in the area where the person is. I don't know of technology to do that yet, but if you know of technology to do that <laughs> and you could incorporate it, 
the NIH would love you. The NIH would love to be able to collect that data. Because right now, with the coat name, we don't know if the kid is smoking, if grandma's smoking, if their friend is smoking. If we could not only know what level of cigarette exposure, but if they're smoking or someone else is smoking, that would be great. Right now, I'm not, I'm not aware that there is that capability right now. We can do one more, one more question, then we're yeah. going to move on. So I, I'm, I've been looking at the, the diagram and trying to visualize what things the kids are going to have to like have on them at all times for this to work. So, I mean, there's the phone, which it sounds like they would pretty much always have. The rescue medication, they should always have, but they might not. And then the controller medication, and then the, the, the Pico... Uh, meter. What's that again? So that, I mean, is that something that they, would, that they would ideally always have with them, or something they would only use certain times of the day? Excellent question. That's, that's very important. And I also, I should have put the health cloud up here, too, um, because all this information has to go to the health cloud, and then the health cloud has to send them automated messages. Um, you're right that... For example, for, for blood pressure or heart rate, there are like stickers or things you can put on a person's body so they don't have to do anything. Mm. It goes directly from the sticker via Bluetooth to their phone. Whereas here, they do need to be within proximity. The phone has to be within proximity of the controller, the rescue, the peak flow meter devices for the Bluetooth to send it to the phone, right? So we would... Um, the, the albuterol should be on them at all times, but the other devices, we would think that they would have to do it at home. And for the first phases, we're going to get a group of highly motivated students be, or participants because we're doing a proof of concept study so we can work those things out. But it's hard because if they're at their girlfriend's house and they're you know, at their friend's house, are they going to have these things with them? Right. Um, but hopefully we can figure out by talking to them by talking to the kids, we can figure out what we can do to make this possible so that they, they, they do feed all of this information into the phone on a daily basis. Okay. Sort of a, sort of a follow-up real quick, though. So do the, the doser CT devices already have a Bluetooth capability in them? No, not right now. The doser CT device right now is just this device that fits on the inhaler and registers how many doses you've taken every 24-hour period. So we have to build the Bluetooth. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. The, the power requirements of that, like, if there's something extra that they would have to charge to make sure that they could communicate, that's... That's another kind of factor. Like problem, but I'm yeah. not sure, I'm not super familiar with the power requirements of Bluetooth, so maybe it wouldn't be a big deal if you just stuff put your battery on. Yeah. All things we have to figure out. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank you.